It's nine o'clock. I'm live in Jerusalem for a special edition of The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Tonight, ramped up rhetoric from Iran, but is it bluster or a genuine threat? Tehran has pledged to reconsider its doctrine of using its nuclear capacity only for peace if its facilities are targeted by Israel. Tonight, we see firsthand the destruction caused by Hezbollah rockets as thousands flee their homes. They're deserted. Most people have left. You can hear birdsong. But the noise from drones and warplanes above is also constant. And inside Gaza, war-weary residents hope an Iranian attack on Israel would provide some respite from bombardment. Tonight, the United Nations will decide whether to recognize the state of Palestine, find out why that vote will likely be blocked. Plus, coming up, the author Salman Rushdie remembers the moment he thought he would die. It would have been foolish not to think so. You know, I, I, I uh, clearly remember thinking that, that this was about to be the end. And can anyone stop India's Narendra Modi? Nearly one billion voters will decide as the world's most populous country goes to the polls. That's all coming up on The World with me, Yelda Hakim. Good evening from a very windy Jerusalem. Well, all the developments from the region in a moment, but we start tonight with some breaking news from Scotland, where the husband of former Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has been charged by police investigating the SNP's finances. Peter Murrell, the party's former chief executive, was taken into custody this morning. Well, let's go live now to Connor Gillies, who joins us now live from Glasgow. And Connor, just bring us up to date. Yalda, this is a significant moment. The police have been examining the Scottish National Party, the biggest political party here in Scotland, the governing party, uh, looking into the funding and finances of them for the past three years. Uh, last year, the house behind me that was searched by Police Scotland detectives as part of that probe it is the home of Peter Murrell, the uh, former chief executive of the SNP for almost two decades, the house that he shares with the former First Minister of Scotland, uh, Nicola Sturgeon. Both of them were arrested last year and released without charge. Uh, and then came news today that Peter Murrell had been re-arrested as part of that probe. He spent 10 hours in police custody, was released, and then came confirmation that he has been charged in connection with embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. Ten hours of questions. Uh, we understand tonight that he has resigned his membership of the SNP. This is a really, really difficult moment. It shows that the police investigation is gathering pace. Prosecutors will now examine the facts here, will examine the allegations and plot the next uh, way ahead. Connor, thank you so much for bringing us up to date there. Well, Israel and Iran have traded rhetoric all week, but today felt a little bit different. You'll remember that last night, the former head of intelligence for the Mossad spy agency told me hitting nuclear facilities inside Iran was not off the table. Well, tonight, the senior general in charge of Tehran's nuclear security warned his country was considering changing its doctrine. And to be clear, that doctrine states that Iran's nuclear program is purely for peaceful purposes. So is this just your typical saber rattling exercise or something much more dangerous? Well, no one knows for sure, but the UK and the US aren't taking any chances. The countries jointly impose sanctions on drone and missile production firms and leading military figures inside Iran, who in response said their military had pinpointed the location of Israel's nuclear sites. That's a serious warning. Well, our finger is on the trigger, they say. Well, Sky's international affairs editor, uh, Dominic Waghorn, has the very latest. We'll come to Dominic's uh, piece in just a moment, but some politicians here have been calling for Israel to strike back hard and fast. Today, I sat down with uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, who urged those who he described as messianic right-wingers to keep quiet. But he did acknowledge that the coalition who worked together to repel the Iranian attack was unprecedented. Just have a listen. 
Well, first of all, we have to recognize that what Iran did was a formal declaration of war against the state of Israel. Because it wasn't just a surprise attack that they didn't assume responsibility for. They declared publicly that they are going to attack Israel. When a country, uh, by its uh, official leaders, declared that they are going to attack, and then they sent 300 uh, uh, missiles and, uh, and the drones uh, and uh, whatever, this is a formal declaration of war. So under normal circumstances, you would expect a response by the country that was attacked. I'm not in favor of this. I think that, strangely or, or fortunately enough, the event on Saturday night turned out to be a total failure for Iran and a great success for Israel and its allies. What we did in intercepting almost 300 drones and missiles is, I think, historically unprecedented. Israel did most of it, but we never would have done uh, all of it without the uh, assistance, the participation, the support participation of uh, the United States, Great Britain, France, and some Arab countries. So the question is, do we have to punish them because of what they did? Or can we absorb the provocation at this time and wait for the right opportunity to put Iran in the right place? But as you know, there are many who believe that if Israel doesn't respond, it's a sign of weakness, that Israel needs to hit Iran and hit them hard. I spoke to the Israeli ambassador to the UK last night and she said we have no choice but to respond and hit Iran back hard. You know that every day when I wake up I pray that some of the people that represent the state of Israel would keep quiet rather than speak. It includes also the Israeli ambassador in Great Britain and not only her. Israel won on Saturday. Israel defeated Iran. Only the messianic extreme right-wingers in the state of Israel think that we have now to enter into a dual fight with Iran, that they will uh, shoot, that we will shoot, that they will shoot, that we will shoot. At the end, it will erupt into a comprehensive war. We don't need it. Are you worried that that's what's going to happen ultimately? I'm afraid. I'm afraid that it may uh, go out of, uh, blow out of uh, control. Uh, and uh, I, although I must say that sometimes I'm impressed with the restraint that Iran has manifested in the past, Saturday they also were, uh, I think, uh, so somewhat um, going out of their habits because of arrogance. Do you see that same sort of arrogance here in Israel? Do you feel it? Yes. Unfortunately, I think that what happened on October 7th is the ultimate evidence of the arrogance of the Prime Minister and his group of thugs that are running the state of Israel on these days. And it's depressing. It's really pained, a pain, a pain in, in the heart of so many Israelis. And maybe a month before October, Netanyahu was standing somewhere in Israel and said, if Iran will dare attack us, we will destroy it. 80 million people. One of the most sophisticated, successful, economically strong countries in the world. And then 5,000 Palestinian terrorists shakes the very foundation of the state of Israel. I mean, you are capable of destroying Iran and you are not capable of defending yourself from 5,000 terrorists coming through the border and killing 1,500 civilians and abducting so many hundreds of them and are keeping them in the tunnels. Now, it's not a proof of the lack of strength. It's a proof of the abundance of arrogance and overconfidence. And this is regrettable. How does Israel recover from this? First, we have to replace our government. We need to get rid of these guys. 
they are not good people. I mean, he's still standing. After the failure, of the security failure of October the 7th, there were many who said, once there is an investigation, heads will roll. Heads rolled after 1973, after 2006. And because of what's happened uh, on October the 7th, heads should roll. Heads, All of these people still remain. Heads will be rolled. It also took more than six months after 73 before the former uh, government was uh, forced out. And it will take a couple of more months. The heads will be rolled. We have to decide how we want to define the main priorities of the State of Israel for the next phase. We have to embark, as difficult as it is, with all the efforts that we're making to recuperate and to rehabilitate the uh, parts that were affected, on a peace plan that will aim at bringing an end to this historic conflict so that it will not be repeated in a couple of years' time again. Which you came very close to in 2007 and 2008. When you look back to that period where you were mulling over maps and looking at you know, what a Palestinian state would look like and how Israel would live side by side with it, to where the things are today, what goes through your mind? We pulled out from Gaza. We proposed the Palestinians a comprehensive peace treaty. What we got is Hamas. That doesn't justify the killing of one innocent person. Okay, when I'm asked how the, you know you killed thirty thousand Palestinians, I said, and if we killed only three thousand innocent civilians, and if we killed only fifteen hundred Palestinians that were embedded together with Hamas in the center of Gaza, and it was in, perhaps inevitable, even though we didn't aim to do it. So what does it make me happy? I don't want to kill one innocent civilian. Ehud Olmert, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That's the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert speaking to me earlier today. Well, let's bring you that report from our international affairs editor, Dominique Waghorn, with the latest. Iran has never shied away from showing off its ballistic missiles, but it's always been more coy about its nuclear ambitions. Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei insisting using nuclear weapons is religiously forbidden. And Iran's always insisted its nuclear program is for civilian purposes, even if Israel and the West don't believe a word of it. But now a senior Iranian commander says that entire nuclear doctrine is under review. If there are any threats or actions by the fake Zionist regime against the country's nuclear facilities aiming at pressuring the Islamic Republic, reconsidering our nuclear doctrine and policy and violating the considerations announced before will be likely and imaginable. And five days after firing crews and ballistic missiles at Israel, the same official warned Iran knows where Israeli nuclear sites are and could target them if it wants to. The enemy's nuclear sites have been identified and we have necessary information about all targets. We have our finger on the trigger to fire powerful missiles to destroy specified targets. Chilling warnings, even if Israel and allies were able to shoot down most of the missiles sent its way by Iran over the weekend. Israel isn't turning down its rhetoric either. Its defence minister saying military activity is being stepped up. Our missions are not going to decrease, they are only going to increase. The reality that we are being attacked from seven different fronts, aerially six fronts, is a complex reality and it will challenge us and accompany us. Allies are urging Israel to let them sanction Iran and not strike back itself. Iran's behaviour is unacceptable and it's right that countries come together here at the G7 and make those points. Not just because of what Iran has been doing, but also as a message to Israel that we want to play our part in having a coordinated strategy that deals with uh, Iran's aggression that we saw so clearly against Israel over the weekend. But Israel says being attacked with hundreds of massive missiles like this demands a response. It will retaliate. It's just a question of when. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News, Jerusalem. 
Well, for now, it's just a war of words, but on Israel's northern border, Hezbollah, backed by Tehran, has been targeting villages and towns with their rockets. Well, let's go straight to our international correspondent, Alex Rossi, who's live tonight in northern Israel near the border with Lebanon. And Alex, over to you. Good evening, Yalda, from northern Israel. Well, sirens have been sounding, really, in many of the communities here this evening. And there has been this daily exchange of fire going on now between the IDF, the Israeli military, and Hezbollah for more than six months, since October the 7th. Now, many people here are thinking that war is going to start very soon. The situation will escalate. Earlier today, we took a drive along the northern border with Lebanon to see for ourselves the situation. The roads through northern Israel along the border with Lebanon are empty of cars. Since October the 7th, the area has been under bombardment from Hezbollah militants. It was shot from there and entered through the wall here. Ariel Frisch, the deputy head of security in Kiryat Shmona, a frontline city, shows me the damage in a residential area. We got attacked by a great wave of missiles. One of the missiles hit this house. Nobody was here because we evacuated the city one week before. And if we were not evacua evacuated, there will be no survivors. The IDF and Hezbollah have been exchanging fire on a daily basis in the north for more than six months. And it feels like a full-scale war may not be far away. It is really eerie walking around these places. They're deserted. Most people have left. The government has in place evacuation orders. Now, Lebanon's over there. That's where we're told most of the missiles are being fired from. But it's very quiet here. We can hear birdsong, but the noise from drones and warplanes above is also constant. Up on the hill, it's already a, a village of, in Lebanon, which is called El Khiyam. A short distance from the border and former IDF commander Gideon Harari, who lives in one of the communities in the line of fire, says a major confrontation is looking more likely. The shooting is daily. Rockets, uh, drones, every day. Now is the, the most dangerous point in the Middle East for the last 40 years. If Israel will take some measures, military measures, against Iran. It might drive us into a Middle East war, a big war. The internally displaced have moved to hotels and guest houses in safer parts of Israel. In Tiberias, the evacuees can only wonder when it will be safe to return. The mood of the people in Israel is very frustrating and it's very dangerous to live here because now it's the, uh, uh, the, the threat from Hezbollah in the north. Tensions are now the highest they've been for decades and that's reflected in the preparations Israel is making. We purchased hundreds of ambulances, hundreds of small vehicles. The National Ambulance Service has been stockpiling equipment in this underground facility. October the 7th changed everything. We are preparing for a long-term uh, campaign or a long-term uh, war. If you would talk to me on, se on September 2023, I would say we have uh, supply for one month. Nowadays, because of what we are expecting and what we are preparing, we have many more months of equipment. Israel now faces crises on multiple fronts. But it is clear the current situation in the north is increasingly untenable. It will not take much for a broader war to break out. Well, Alex, just picking up on what you were saying there at the end of your report, Israel is dealing with a number of uh, crises on multiple fronts. And then, of course, we continue to hear today those threats from Iran as well. Yeah, I mean, we're in Tiberias at the moment, which is where lots of the internally displaced people have come uh, to Yalda. So you can see that they have been pushed out of the areas in the north. 
Israel, of course, this is sovereign territory up in the north, but people can't inhabit it, which is causing all sorts of problems. Now, when it comes to the rhetoric between uh, the Iranians and the Israelis, the dynamic has fundamentally changed, and Saturday changed everything. Now, prior to Saturday, the war was fought here, as it was known as a, a shadow war. It was hidden. Iran fought Israel through its proxies. Israel carried out attacks like we saw on the consulate or would hit arms being shipped from the, uh, across the Shia Crescent into Lebanon. But it was all below the surface. Now it's broken out into the open. Now, the attack on Saturday is an indication from the Iranians of a new red line. It's a new reality. Now, the question, of course, is will the Israelis test that reality by attacking back? And that's what this war of words is now about. They're saying, we've done this. You can't carry on as you did before when we had this hidden war. You can't hit us and we won't do anything. We will now respond and we will respond fiercely. And it's why, in my report, you heard uh, a number of people saying that this is truly a really dangerous time not just for Israel, not just for the Lebanese, not to, but really for the whole of the region, the most dangerous time here for decades. Alex, uh, thank you so much uh, for your reporting and all of your analysis there. Well, officials from Israel and the U.S. held a virtual meeting about a possible ground invasion in Rafa. Today, Sky News heard from one woman in the southern city who says she felt grateful for Iran's support. Have a listen. I hope Iran will strike. Iran's support for us is good. It will reduce the pressure we are facing. It will help reduce the shelling. It will help stop our children getting killed. It will reduce the arrests we face. We will feel better. A voice from Gaza there. Well, in the next hour or so, delegates at the United Nations are expected to vote on granting the state of Palestine full membership to the United Nations. Let's go straight to our U.S. correspondent, James Matthews, who joins us from Washington. And, James, the big question is, will they be granted membership? Hi, Yalda. Yeah, the big answer is no. They might well have the numbers they need inside that U.N., Security Council chamber, but they will get an American veto, a decisive veto. Um, so it won't go any further at this stage. I expect the Brits to abstain. The thinking being uh, from the UK end of things is that now uh, is not the time for a Palestinian state whilst they support the aspiration. But in terms of the Americans, I mean, this discussion has been ongoing in the Security Council all day. The vote due in about 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, the Palestinians say this would right a historical injustice to give full membership of the UN Security Council to the uh, Palestinian Authority. That would be to recognize a Palestinian state, first requested in the year 2011. But the Americans are saying now is not the time, effectively. Apart from anything else, Hamas, a terrorist organization, is at the heart of matters in Gaza, and Gaza would be at the heart of this resolution that's being discussed at the moment. At the moment, the Americans have also long said that uh, it shouldn't be for the UN to decide on the creation of a Palestinian state. That should be something that should be the subject of negotiations between the Palestinians and Israel. Of course, that isn't going to happen. Israel certainly wouldn't countenance that. And Joe Biden will pay due heed to the Israeli view on that one. He will also pay due attention to the Palestinian Authority and its weaknesses, uh, claims of corruption and a lack of influence that it can wield in a part of the world where Western diplomats would want it to be more credible and more influential. And James, we've also been seeing pro-Palestinian protests in, in New York and several other cities. Uh, we have. In fact, over the course of the past six months, Yalda, we have seen protests at American universities. Today, we have seen arrests by police of students at Columbia University in New York. Among those suspended from university, three students, including the daughter of uh, the Congresswoman Ilham Omar. She was arrested yesterday. But uh, these scenes at Columbia University, they relate to an encampment. Tents have been set up over recent weeks and months. And America's universities have been a focus 
for protest from both sides of the Israel-Palestinian divide. And in parallel to the protest has been this debate across the United States about the right to freedom of speech on university campuses, the right to protest, and the entitlement of universities to, to intrude, to weigh in, and to call in the police, and all the implications that has for free expression. James, thank you so much uh, for all of that. Now, stay with me, because coming up, uh, we'll be turning uh, to the battle in Washington, both uh, about Israel and Ukraine's war. Could billions of dollars be unlocked in Washington this weekend? I'll speak to a Democratic congresswoman next. I think some of the articles are a little bit misleading. So let's remember what vegan food is, first of all. It's food that's free from meat, dairy, eggs and fish. And a message for all vegans and the entire nation is that what we need to be focusing on is fruit, vegetables, beans, legumes, whole grains. Those are the foods that are going to help prevent disease, feed your good gut bacteria, our good gut bacteria eat fibre, help us maintain a healthy weight really, really easily without dieting. Those are the foods we really, really need to be focusing on. But sometimes when people hear the word vegan food, they think all of the processed foods, and they can play a part. This is all vegan food in front of you, isn't this, it? This is all vegan food, absolutely. Would you eat it? I eat mostly whole foods, mostly plant-based whole foods, and that's what maintains my health, my gut, great energy, um, and hopefully is going to help prevent disease in my later life. Processed red meat and red meat are classified as type 1 and type 2 carcinogens, so we do need to worry about things like potential disease later in life. There's many other ways of making this sort of food. You can make it with other... Sub they're called substitutes, but really they're just foods in themselves, like tofu and tempeh, which are made from soybeans. You can make your curries without any of this sort of stuff, for example, using chickpeas instead of chicken. That would be the absolute healthier way of doing things. Um, there's a huge, huge range when it comes to plant-based meats. There are some that are made with less ingredients than others. There are some that are cheaper than others. There are some that taste really fantastic. There are some that are just very much soya-based, for example, or and a lot healthier. So it really, really depends. But personally, for me, there's other ones other than these that I might eat. But people love these. And like I said, they're great for transition. They're great for the environment, much better than meat. And we still know that these foods don't have the cholesterol in that meat have or the trans fat. They often have less saturated fat. And we know that red meat, even two portions a week, can increase our risk of type 2 diabetes. Welcome back, live in Jerusalem. $84 billion, that's how much the US president wants to release to fund Israel and Ukraine. More financial backing for Ukraine has been in limbo for months as Russia steps up its attacks. Well, I'm joined now by Democratic Congressman Dina Titus, who is also a senior member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for joining us here on the program. Are you confident uh, that the aid um, for both Israel and Ukraine will pass? 
Well, I certainly hope so. We're set to do on Saturday what we could have and should have done two months ago. And the end result of the bill will not be that much different from what it was when it started over on the Senate side. Well, no doubt that Ukraine especially will be watching very closely. Um, they have been incredibly frustrated uh, at the blocking of this bill. Um, what would you say to them tonight? Well, it, they put out a plea to the United States and to the rest of the world, and a lot of uh, Western Europe has stepped up and the United States hasn't. That shows that we aren't a very reliable ally and it taints our image internationally. I would say to Ukraine, thank you for being so brave and holding on, but now the reinforcements are on the way. Uh, we've heard stories that some of the units couldn't even fire a, any kind of ammunition because they were out of bullets over the last 60 days. Hopefully this will take care of the problem. And we have to look at it not just as defending Ukraine, but protecting democracy from the further spread of Putin. Because today, Ukraine, tomorrow, Moldova, Romania, who knows what next? Congresswoman, you've said that it, it shows that the United States is an unreliable partner. And frankly, uh, the Ukrainians, President Zelensky, has expressed that over the past few days, saying that uh, the United States and the allies were quick to come to Israel's defense um, and, and assist them uh, in dealing with Iran's attack. But they haven't been able to show that kind of solidarity for Ukraine. Unfortunately, it's all been caught up in bad politics. You had the presidential candidate for the Republicans saying, don't fund this or don't fix the border, don't take any action that would help Biden, don't help another country until you help yourselves, and the Republicans have fallen in line behind that. Now, the support for Israel is more bipartisan and more long-term, long-ongoing. But certainly, as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I have a number of ambassadors and delegations who stop by to see me, and they're circumspect at first, but by the time the conversation is over, you can tell they're very concerned about the U.S.'s uh, internal politics and things that are going on in the Congress that are just political games instead of doing what we should do, enacting reasonable foreign policy that supports our friends and allies. I'm currently uh, in Jerusalem, and we arrived here to, to cover uh, those attacks at the weekend by Iran that was launched uh, on Israel. But we've also been following all the developments with the humanitarian crisis, the famine, the rising death toll, the more than 30,000 people who have been killed inside Gaza. Do you believe that the aid to Israel should be unconditional? Well, if you look at the bill that passed out of the Senate and the one that's before us now, included in the bill that gives the aid to Israel also gives humanitarian aid to Gaza. There's kind of a false equivalency set up that you can't support Israel's right to defend itself and help the innocent people who are being hurt in Gaza. I don't think you have to make that difference or distinction. I think you can do both. Well, I guess some would say that the uh, aid that you're uh, providing to Israel, and especially the military aid, uh, would also be being used in, in Gaza. I'm sure they do. You see a lot of protests across the country. I'm a college professor. I see it on campuses. Uh, we see it in the, in the hearing rooms where you see people stand up in support of Gaza. I think the longer this goes on, the more people and innocent children you see on television who have been killed or orphaned, the more public pressure will increase to help you humanitarian aid and get to a ceasefire. That's what we need. But that ceasefire is contingent on on releasing the hostages, and that's the number one priority. Congressman Dina Titus, thank you very much for joining us here on the program. Thank you. Well, you're, you're watching The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Coming up, we'll hear from the author, Salman Rushdie. He's been remembering the attack that left him with life-changing injuries and the ideology of lone attackers.
Welcome back. Nearly one billion people registered to vote. One million polling stations, 15 million polling officials travelling the country by foot, train, boats, even elephants. It's the largest democratic exercise the world has ever seen. Indians begin casting ballots tomorrow in a process that will last six weeks. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is confident of winning a third term in office, though his opponents say he's unfairly tipped the scales in his favour. Neville Lazarus reports. India's mammoth election season has kicked off. Almost a billion voters will cast their franchise over the next 44 days to elect its government. <laughs> Atul Garg is contesting from Ghaziabad, one of the largest constituencies in the country with almost 3 million voters. His first foray into national politics, he is a candidate from Prime Minister Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party. Everybody is so confident that Modi is coming again as Prime Minister with the 400 MPs. Karg is lucky to get personal endorsement. Modi did a roadshow. The atmosphere is carnival-like. A star campaigner for his party, Prime Minister Modi leaves no stone unturned as he covers the length and breadth of this country. Undoubtedly, Prime Minister Modi is the most popular politician in the country. He is expected to win his third term in these elections. The challengers say that it isn't a level playing field so far. At a joint rally, opposition parties gather to protest the misuse of government machinery to cripple them. They accuse Prime Minister Modi of using federal agencies to raid, intimidate and in some cases jail leaders. Delhi's chief minister was arrested on corruption charges a few weeks before the elections. Thousands of his supporters took to the streets in protest. It's important to understand that this election is a fundamentally different election. I don't think democracy has been as much at risk. The constitution has been as much at, as, at risk as it is today. For a decade, Prime Minister Modi has dominated the political space. With a mix of muscular religious identity and nationalism, he has crafted his image as a leader of the majority Hindu nation that has taken its rightful place. Even though he underlines his achievements of economic progress and development for all, minorities, especially the Muslims, feel marginalized and persecuted. And a question over the democratic and secular values that the country was created upon. Neville Lazarus, Sky News. Delhi. I thought it was the end. That's what the author Sir Salman Rushdie told me as he recounted the moment he was stabbed multiple times at a public event nearly two years ago. He suffered life-changing injuries, including the loss of his right eye more than 35 years after Iran's leader issued a fatwa calling for his death. His book, The Satanic Verses, was published in 1989 and is still considered to be blasphemous by many Muslims. We spoke about lone attackers and fanaticism, but he began by describing those 30 seconds that changed his life. I mean, according to the newspapers, he had a, just, just under half a minute um, before he was uh, restrained. Um, I mean, half a minute with a knife, is, you can do a lot. Uh, and I mean, then I, I keep trying to count the number of injuries and I keep getting different results, but I think somewhere around 14, 15 different injuries uh, to different parts of my body, obviously the most serious being the, the wound to the eye. Um, but fortunately, he missed a lot of places which would have been immediately fatal. Like, you know, the, the, although although there was a big cut across my neck, he didn't he didn't get the artery. And although there were three injuries to my torso, he didn't he didn't reach the heart. And so, you know, in, in that sense, that that was. Um, I mean, that was a piece of good fortune in the middle of the very unpleasant experience. Did you at any point, I mean, I know you've spoken about being conscious and then half conscious. Did you mm. 
at any point feel like, yes, this is, this is the moment that, that uh, I'm facing death? Yes, I quite clearly thought that. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I was aware of lying on the floor in a, in a, in a quite substantial lake of blood. And it would have been foolish not to think so, you know. And I, I, I uh, clearly remember thinking that that this was about to be the end. And I mean, unfortunately, I was wrong. You've often spoken about, or you have spoken about, not wanting to be defined by this fatwa that was issued so long ago, and living your life based on that. And that's why you were you were so freely, uh, you know, operating without security. Have you now been mm. forced back into that kind of security bubble? I mean, not completely, but somewhat. Yeah. I mean, I think I think now we have to be more careful than before, and so. Yeah, there, I mean, I don't want to talk about details of security on television, but but we're but we're aware of it, and we have uh, arranged for security, which we use when when it seems sensible. I want to ask you about the issue of fanaticism, extremism. I mean, how do we contend with it? You know, in, especially in such a polarized world. Well, you contend with it by not giving into it. You know. Um, and um, I mean, many fanatical groups in the Islamic world are the the people they oppress most are other Muslims. You know, I mean that. I mean that's what's certainly true about the rule of the Ayatollahs in Iran, and it's true about the rule of the Taliban in Afghanistan, and 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 so on. So the the first people who are the victims of fanaticism are ordinary members of this of the same faith group. So it, it, you, we need to act together to destroy this thing. But it, don't ask me how. I'm, I'm just a storyteller. You talk a lot in, in your book about, or well, one of the themes is, is time and the fact that, uh, you know, you, you say, uh, you know, why now? Why this moment? Yeah, it did feel like a, a kind of almost anachronistic event, you know, something coming out of the past. Because, I mean, I've, you know, I've been living in New York City since the year 2000. So that's a long time. And I mean, during that time, I've done, I mean, I would say hundreds of public events, uh, the lectures, readings, literary festivals, you know, the whole spectrum of things that writers are asked to do. And, and there's never been a f shadow or a hint of trouble before. There's just been perfectly ordinary, pleasant events. Um, so this did come out of the blue, and and, um, and it is very strange because the this attacker was only 24 years old when he did this, which means he wasn't even alive at the time of the original threat. But he does seem to have been a kind of loner who had spent several years locked up in his mother's basement apartment, uh, basically watching YouTube. And... Um, somewhere along that line, decided to, to stage this attack. I mean, it is somewhat a mystery because he had no previous record. You know, he, had, he had no record of, of, of criminal activity. He, he was, as far as I know, he was not on any terrorism watch list. Um, he just came out of left field, as they say. I mean, did you write this book now because you won't be silenced, because you, you continue to fight for and believe in, in freedom of expression? Yeah, I mean, for sure. And, and also, you know, I'm a writer. It's what I do. And, and if something of this kind of significance happens in a writer's life, it's not unnatural that the writer should want to, handle, to tackle it, you know, to deal with it. Uh, for me, it was actually, it felt like, felt like a way of regaining control of the narrative, you know, and, and to be able to say to myself, this isn't just something happening to me. This is something that I'm dealing with in my way. Um, and, and the book is that. The book is my um, way of doing that. 
That was uh, Salman Rushdie speaking to me there. We've just got some breaking news that's just come in. Uh, lawyers in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial um, have selected the 12 jurors who will uh, decide guilt or innocence. He is the first US president to face criminal charges which stem from hush money payment uh, to the porn star Stormy Daniels. So we've just got an update now that uh, for that historical criminal trial, um, 12 jurors have been selected and they'll assess his guilt or innocence over the coming uh, weeks in that case over hush money payment uh, to Stormy Dan Daniels. Lawyers for the defence and the prosecution um, still must select alternate jurors for the trial, uh, but it is the first uh, time ever that a former US president is the defendant. Now, this is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Next up, we'll be reflecting on what's been an extraordinary week here in Israel uh, with the help of our international affairs editor, Dominic Wack. On News at 10, Peter Murrell, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, is charged in connection with embezzlement of SNP funds. The latest warnings from Iran to Israel, plus Team GB's kit for the Paris Olympics. Join me at 10. Big stories don't always come from big cities. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent and this is where I grew up. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, that the wind is the really big problem. It is back-breaking work and the smoke is thick. It's been working well. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? Sorry. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. We're terrified. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Hopefully this will be the last wave. I never knew they would make it. It's amazing. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. Wales was the first to introduce the plastic bag charge. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi.
Welcome back. It's been five days since we saw those Iranian missiles being intercepted in the night sky over Israel. Let's just look at the key moments in the momentous week. Well, we're hearing quite a lot of activity now. You can obviously hear the sirens. We're also hearing the sound of explosions as well. We've seen a lot of um, what look like air defense interception systems over uh, Jerusalem. A new day in Israel, but the unprecedented attack by Iran has left this country feeling shaken. We ran outside because there was no bomb shelter in the house. Uh, and yeah, and you have to like reassure the kids that everything will be fine, even though you are frightened. Saturday night was something very, very new because there was a certain sense of vulnerability for a few hours. Leaders in the US, the UK and Europe are all watching and waiting to see what Israel does next. Admiral, when will you strike back? We will respond in our time, in our place, in the way that we will choose. If you ask me, I don't think that we should retaliate against Iran itself. It will probably trigger a cycle of violence. If the tiniest invasion is made by the Zionist regime against our homeland or our interests, they must be certain that they will face a very massive and harsh response. The Middle East is a light. Tensions are extraordinarily high. I want to make clear that we will make our own decisions and the state of Israel will do all that is needed to defend itself. So it's now fair game. Anything and everything is on the table, including targeting no, nuclear no facilities? No doubt. Everything is on the table right now. Including targeting nuclear facilities? Including everything. The missiles were fired on Israel and the same drones are the ones heating European soil in Ukraine. And when we're thinking about the range of those missiles, they can get to London. OK, let's bring in our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn. Dominic, I mean, we're looking at that montage. It's been quite a week. Yeah, it's been an extraordinary week. Um, there's been a massive and dangerous sea change in the geopolitics of the region. For half a century, 45 years, uh, Israel and Iran, kind of sworn to each other's destruction effectively, have fought with each other, but in the shadows. So things have gone mysteriously bang in Tehran. Centrifuges have exploded deep underground in Iran. Uh, scientists have been assassinated, and in return, Iran has supported all kinds of groups attacking Israel, but always uh, by uh, proxy. Uh, they have not attacked Israel directly, and then on Saturday they did because they felt Israel had crossed the line attacking their diplomatic facility in Tehran, in, in Damascus. So there are two questions tonight. One is, at the end of these extraordinary five days, one is, um, can the Israelis retaliate in such a way that they, it doesn't plunge the region into yet more uncharted territory, an even bigger conflict? The second question is, uh, can the war recede back into the shadows. Now, um, Iran could be discouraged by the knowledge that this coalition was formed around Israel protecting it, uh, but I think the line has been crossed there, and that taboo that Iran's always respected, it would not attack Israel directly, that's held it back in previous calculations, that's gone now. So if it's attacked again, it's going to be easier, more tempted to strike back. So forever, I think, the region is a more dangerous place. Yeah, as you say, uh, Dom, what we've been hearing is those red lines have gone. Well, we'll be following all the developments. Thank you so much for watching. Good night for now.
It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10. Our top story. The man who ran Scotland's ruling party for more than two decades is charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds. Peter Murrell is the husband of the SNP's former leader and first minister, Nicola Sturgeon. The party says tonight the development will come as a shock. We're also live in Jerusalem tonight after this warning from Iran. The country's military says its fingers on the trigger over nuclear sites and a potential change to its nuclear doctrine. That warning of retaliation using advanced weapons comes as we see the impact of the current conflict between Israel and Iran's proxies in Lebanon. They're deserted. Most people have left. You can hear birdsong. But the noise from drones and warplanes above is also constant. And tonight, another point of tension, a United Nations vote over admitting Palestine to the organization expected to be vetoed by the US. More stormy weather for efforts to control climate change as Scotland's government, following the UK's, cuts back on its commitments. The latest Conservative MP suspended from his party, this time over allegations of misuse of campaign funds. Flying the flag for Team GB, we see the patriotic kit which athletes will wear at the Olympics. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30 right through to midnight. Good evening. The husband of the dominant figure in Scottish politics of the last decade has been charged tonight following a long-running investigation into the alleged embezzlement of funds. Peter Murrell has been Nicola Sturgeon's partner for more than two decades. During that time, he's also served as the SNP's chief executive. He was first arrested a year ago. The party said tonight that the news would come as a shock. From Glasgow, our Scotland correspondent, Conor Gillis, reports. One year ago, this was the scene as police searched the home of the former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and her husband Peter Murrow. They were Scotland's political power couple for so long. She as SNP leader, he as the chief executive for two decades. Police Scotland searched the party's HQ last year in a probe examining its funding and finances dating back to 2021. Nicola Sturgeon herself was also arrested and later released without charge. In what is the most dramatic moment so far, detectives here in Scotland have now confirmed Peter Murrell has been charged in connection with embezzlement of funds. The 59-year-old spent more than 10 hours in police custody facing questions. I'm not sure if you heard what I just said. I'm not going to comment on an ongoing police inquiry. It'd be wrong to do it. I think now Police Scotland need to be given the space to do their job, to complete the investigation um, without any interference. Arriving home after a difficult day for him, his wife and the SNP. The case is now with prosecutors. Any comment, Mr Morrow? And Connor joins me now. Connor, putting the investigation itself 